And I was driving home after giving a speech at a sales conference. I was uh, selling Cutco Cutlery. I gave a speech at an event. I would, my car was hit head on by a drunk driver at 70 to 80 miles per hour. And I was found dead at the scene. Uh, I broke 11 bones. Uh, I clinically died for six minutes. No heartbeat, not breathing for six minutes. They revived me on a medevac helicopter, taking me to the hospital. I spent six days in a coma, flatlined twice more when I came out of the coma. I was told by doctors that I would never walk again uh, and that I had permanent brain damage. Welcome back to another edition of Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I am thrilled that you're here. And boy, do you guys have a treat today. So I've got Hal Elrod on today, who's the author of the book called The Miracle Morning. He's written lots of other books, I think 12 in total, but that's the that's the big one. And uh, I, I asked his team to bring him back on, which I've never done before, by the way, bring an author back on like this. But uh, he has enhanced the original book. He's got a new book, and I'll let him tell you all about it. But, you know, I, let me pre frame this by saying I'm so impressed with his previous work that I've given his book to probably 2,000 of my warriors over the years, okay? Uh, that's one of the gifts they all get. And my love language is gifts, so they always uh, get gifts from me, but that is absolutely one of the most important ones they get. So it's a real treat for me to have him back on. Hal, welcome back, brother. Rod, man, it's an honor to be here, but the fact that you know, I just found out right before we started recording that you've given away 2,000 copies of The Miracle Morning, and I cannot tell you how much that means to me. Obviously, how uh, much it means to the people that received it, but uh, your support is is so, 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 uh, I, I just so appreciate it. Thank you, man. No, you bet. And, and you know, I, I got caught up in that, that I really didn't um, give you a proper introduction by any stretch. Um, <laughs> your, your story is so freaking amazing, what you've been through, that um, I'd like you to share that um, before we dig into your new project and the reason I wanted you back on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, there's a new part of the story that I, I never used to share, and I just recently started sharing it. Um, it came up in an interview organically, and then it was really impactful. So, when I was eight years old, um, that was my first kind of uh, experience with life and death, not personally, but I woke up uh, one morning. Uh, again, I was eight years old. My mom was home. My 18-month-old sister, Amory, was home. And my dad was at work. And my younger sister was at my grandma's house. And I woke up to my mother screaming. And my sister, Amory, died in her arms that morning. So I watched my sister oh. die uh, at eight years old. And she was just a baby. And uh, what I what I saw from that was, I mean, obviously, it, you know, it, it was devastating for our family. But within about six to twelve months, my mother was leading a support group for other parents who had lost children, and she turned her pain into purpose. And I really learned that from her at a young age. And then my dad started a fundraiser to raise money for the hospital that cared for my sister uh, while she was alive. She had a really rare uh, birth defect that caused the de eventual death. Um, but, but so I saw my parents take this tragedy and rather than wallow in it and feel sorry for themselves, they, they asked, how can I use this experience to help other people? You fast forward, uh, 12 years later at age 20, and I was driving home after giving a speech at a sales conference. I was uh, selling Cutco Cutlery. I gave a speech at an event. I would, my car was hit head on by a drunk driver at 70 to 80 miles per hour. And I was found dead at the scene. Uh, I broke 11 bones. Uh, I clinically died for six minutes, no heartbeat, not breathing for six minutes. They revived me on a medevac helicopter, taking me to the hospital. I spent six days in a coma, flatlined twice more when I came out of the coma. I was told by doctors that I would never walk again uh, and that I had permanent brain damage. And within a matter of days, I started asking myself, how can I use this experience to help other people? And realizing that my parents did that. And so I also decided I'm not taking the doctor's prognosis as the only option uh, that I'm never going to walk again. And I decided if I never walk again, I'll be the happiest person you've ever seen in a wheelchair because I'm in a wheelchair either way. I won't let the unchangeable affect my mental state, which is always changeable. Um, and a week later, I took my first step. And a month later, I gave a speech at my high school that I graduated from a few years prior. And you know the rest is kind of of a history, and then we can we can get back into. There was another tragedy six years ago with cancer, but but let's. I think that's enough for now. <laughs> well, I actually, I, I mean, 
I'd rather you shared it, buddy, because okay. it's it's so imp it's so amazing, you know, th that you've been you've been smacked on the side of the head a few times, and you're still here and you're still thriving. I mean, I tell my story about losing fifty million dollars and recovering mm. from that, and and you know, and and that's a different kind of a uh, of a of a problem. But yeah, yeah. please please share the cancer yeah. thing real quick. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, after you, you, you literally die in a head on collision, you think, okay, I've, I've, I, that's it. Um, um, you know, my parents wanted to keep me in a bubble from that point on. Right. Um, but at age 37, so I was so eight when my sister died 20, when the car accident happened. And then at 37, which was seven years ago, um, uh, my, I went into the hospital, my lung, I couldn't breathe. And after about seven days of draining my lung every other day, I was diagnosed with a rare aggressive form of cancer called acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, and I was given a 20 to 30% chance of surviving. So, uh, you know, 70 to 80% of those that get this cancer end up dying and it causes your organs to fail. And when I went into the hospital, my heart was failing, my kidneys were failing and my lungs, one lung was failing. And the doctor said, you have one to three weeks to live if you don't start chemo tomorrow. And I wow. said, I don't want to poison my body with chemo. I want to heal this naturally. And he said, you don't have that luxury. This cancer doesn't give you time to try to heal it naturally. And I, and I, 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 um, I said, Let, give me 24 hours to do my own research. And I called some of the best holistic oncologists in the country. And they both told me, uh, I mean, one of them is famous. He cured Suzanne Summers of cancer multiple times. Both of them said how the doctor, your doctor was not exaggerating. You literally have one to three weeks to live and chemo is your best bet. There's nothing we can do for you. And so I ended up on a seven month chemo regimen, 650 hours of chemotherapy over seven months because it's an aggressive cancer. They hit it as hard as they possibly can with chemotherapy. Um, and I maintain the same mindset that, and here's, here's what I'll close with. <clears throat> My, my wife was naturally distraught listening to the doctor say there's only a 20 to 30% chance I was going to survive. And once we got home, I said, sweetheart, you know, look at me. I want you to know the 20 to 30% survival rate. That's a statistic based on the collective, based on people that live in fear, people that eat horrible junk food, people that have a terrible mindset. I said, I'm not in that group. I said, in my mind, there's a 100% chance that I will be among the 20 to 30% of those that survive this cancer because I will do everything they did and more to do everything in my power to beat it. And um, I, I'm here seven years later, I, uh, I I survived and knock on wood, I think I've been through uh, enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, uh, Let's let, you know what, God's got a sense of humor, something else will pop up, but well, hopefully sure. nothing as dramatic as, as you've had. And I have to share something just because of this. I didn't intend to, but I can't let it go by. You know, my daughter, got diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia and 85% uh, of her bone marrow. She spent eight months in Moffitt Cancer Center because she had surgeries wow. for GI issues. And and before she went in, I'm very big on holistic as well. I've got a whole library downstairs of holistic methodologies. And so we got, I actually got her on ivermectin before she went mm. in. I mm. actually, she was doing colonic uh, uh, coffee enemas. She was doing uh, juicing every single day, ozone treatment, oxygen treatment, all sorts of holistic stuff. They told her that she would have been their fastest recovery patient if she hadn't had the GI issues that popped up while she was mm. in there. That's how fast her blood recovered. And I believe it was what we did before she went in there. But I just, yeah. you know, uh, wow is all well, I can Rod, tell I will you, brother. Say, every single thing you mentioned except the ivermectin, I didn't know about that back then. Yeah. I did. I did coffee enemas three times a week. Yep. I took, I juiced every day. I took 70 supplements a day. I did ozone sauna multiple yep. times a week. So yeah, man, I yep. mean, totally on the same All page. of that. Yeah, no, I, I researched it and, and ivermectin is a freaking miracle drug. And I know I'll get haters about the whole COVID sure. crap on here. And I don't care, honestly, because yeah. I know I've, it, I cured myself from COVID in like a day and a half on ivermectin. But, but I researched it that it, that it in conjunction with chemo is incredibly powerful. So I, I didn't even want to tell the doctors. I said, this, you just take these. She trusted me completely because she knew I'd researched this stuff for years. I I actually, you know, I actually used to have a 501c3 called a Better Choice Foundation, which was around natural and holistic ways to treat and cure wow. cancer. I, I never took it and did anything with it, but I'd lost a, someone close to me uh, to breast cancer when I was younger, and I started this foundation. I just, I never ran with it, but, but anyway, yeah. So interesting. But I know, guys, I know this isn't real estate. We're not talking about real estate, but we're we're here because Hal is awesome at helping you start your day out right. And so mm. let's go there. Let's talk about, mm. 
why the Miracle Morning has changed so many freaking lives over the years. And I know it's changed numerous of my uh, scores of my students. In fact, I had one student that did it, I think, straight for years. Uh, his name's Powell. He's one of my exemplary students, and he did it for years. It was like a big deal, like he'd been doing this for so long. But anyway, please talk about yeah. the book and why it's so awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, the original Miracle Morning book was born out of the 2008 Great Recession. And uh, I, like you know, millions of Americans, I lost not everything, but, but damn near close. I lost over half of my income, so I couldn't pay the mortgage. My house was foreclosed on, first house I'd ever bought. Um, and, uh, I, I stopped exercising, uh, my body fat percentage tripled and I was really physically, mentally, emotionally, and definitely financially in the lowest point in my life. And I heard a quote from Jim Rohn. So six months into this downward financial spiral, living on credit cards and Jim Rohn, I heard him say, your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development. And when I heard that rod, you know, being in sales, I'm a numbers guy as well, you know, like you are. Um, and my brain quantified that I went, okay, wait your level of success will rarely exceed your level of personal development. What level of success do I want in my life on a scale of one to 10? And of course the answer is 10. I don't know anybody that doesn't want to be as happy and healthy and financially secure as they can be. Then I ask myself, what's my level of personal development every day? Like what's my daily personal development ritual like? And it was like a two or a three, like I had nothing consistent. I would read, I would, you know, this and that, but, 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 but relative to a 10, it was very low. And I realized, I believe this is the disconnect for 90 nine percent of our society is if you're looking at my hands right got one at the top of my head that's that level 10 success that we want but if your level of personal development in terms of your daily rituals isn't in alignment with a 10 if it's a two or a three or a four that's the disconnect and when i heard that i go I, I i went okay i've got to create the most effective proven personal development daily ritual uh that, that, that combines what the world's most successful people do for their personal development so I can become the level 10 version of myself that is capable of turning my financial situation around and creating and sustaining the level of success that I want. And I just went online, Rod, I Googled, you know, what do the world's most successful people do for personal development? And I was looking for like one or two practices. And after about 30, 45 minutes, I had a list of six. It was meditation, affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading, and journaling. And depending on which article you read or which interview you watched, any one of those, somebody would have said this was the number one key, like Ray Dalio, billionaire investor. When he's asked what the number one key to his financial success is, he says meditation, right? Like that for me was a, was, was a, a paradigm shift because I always thought of like monks in a monastery, not billionaires, but he, but he attributes his best ideas, best breakthroughs, not to mention managing his daily stress it's his meditation. So the epiphany for me came when I almost got overwhelmed. I almost threw in the towel and I went, I can't do all of these. Which one's the best? And then the epiphany was, wait, what if I did all of them? What if I woke up 30 to 60 minutes earlier tomorrow, even though I'm not a morning person, I wasn't back then. And I do the six most timeless proven personal development practices that the world's most successful people in all walks of life have sworn by for centuries. I thought that would be the ultimate daily ritual to increase my level of personal development to be a 10 so I can create the success I want. And I'll, I'll close the story with this. I was thinking it'd be one year out. Like, give me a year. You know, I'll get a little better every day, 1% better every day. I can turn this thing around. In less than two months, at the height of the Great Recession, I more than doubled my income. So the economy didn't get better. I got better. Yeah. I went from being in the worst shape of my life physically to committing to run a 52 mile ultra marathon because I hated running. And I thought, what would a level 10 be physically? I thought I have a friend that ran a 52 mile ultra marathon. How about that? I've never run more than a mile. So I don't even know who I'd have to become to run 52 in a row, but I'm going to figure it out. Um, and my depression didn't take two months to go away. It started fading on day one because the depression was caused by hopelessness and fear of the future. But my very first miracle morning, I went, this is the one thing that's going to change everything. So now I have hope that if I get better, I can change my life and make it the way that I want it to be. Repeat those six again, please. So now they're organized in an acronym. This makes it a lot easier to remember. And I owe this to my Great. wife. She gave me this idea when I was writing the original book. Uh, nice. Savers. And if you're taking notes, you can write them uh, vertically, right? S-A-V-E-R-S. -E the first S is for silence. 
That is your meditation or your prayer time to center you first thing in the morning. The A is for affirmations. And we can dive into that because I think affirmations have a bad rap. I'm going to teach them to you in a very effective, very different way. The v I use them. I use. By the way, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I've used affirmations for decades. I have them down on my wall in my exercise room below us here. I mean, for decades. So I'd love to talk about. Yes. I'm sorry, they're silence affirmations. Yeah. Of all the sabers, they're my favorite. Uh, the V is for visualization, and all I have to think about is that the world's greatest athletes, right, the best athletes in the world, utilize visualization to show up at their best every single day. And why wouldn't we do the same? The E in savers is for exercise. You don't have to go to the gym in the morning, but 60 seconds of jumping jacks at the very minimum, get your heart rate up, get the blood and oxygen flowing to your brain so you have more energy and more mental clarity. The R in savers is for reading. Uh, And, you know, we're all one book away from one strategy that we need to transform our lives. And the S in savers is for scribing which is a fancy word for journaling, but the J would have made the acronym really awkward, right? Saber <laughs> jo- um, but uh, but so every day, getting clarity, pen to paper, right? It takes the, the thoughts, the stressors out of your head, puts them on paper. I write down what I'm grateful for, and I, I, I sit with that for a minute and feel deeply grateful for my wife, my life, my kids. And then I write down, I look at my to-do list, I got 20 things on there, and I ask myself, what is the number one thing that I might not want to do, I might be procrastinating on because it's scary, it's out of my comfort zone. What's the number one thing that's going to move the needle in my life or business? I'm going to commit on paper to do that first before I get to the rest of the to-do list. And I'll close by quoting Robert Kiyosaki, or at least paraphrasing. I spoke at an event. Robert was the headliner. I was his warm-up act. This was 2015, I think. I gave him a copy of The Miracle Morning thinking, the guy's worth $80 million. I don't think he needs my little self-published book, but you miss all the shots you don't take. Who knows, right? right? I gave him the book. Three weeks later, his assistant emailed me and said, Robert has read The Miracle Morning three times. <laughs> that dropped my jaw, right? Wait, well, he's read my book three times in three weeks. You got to be kidding me. She said, it's changing its life and he wants to have you on Rich Dad Radio. So I was on cloud nine. I'm actually going back on there next week, by the way. He's, he's become a nice. friend. But um, but Robert said, basically at the end of the interview, he said, Hal, you named the book The Miracle Morning. It's the perfect name. He said, I'll tell you why. He said, before I read The Miracle Morning or before you wrote the book and you, you came up with a savers acronym, he said, every successful person on the planet swears by at least one of the savers. Maybe they do two or three. He said, but I've never met anyone in my entire life that did all six of those ancient best practices. And he said, if you do one of them, it'll change your life. If you do all six, you will experience miracles. He said, I'm losing weight. I'm the happiest I've been. Like he was in a, he's told me he was in a dark, like not a good place. When you read the book, he lost like 40 pounds. He like, you know, just, it was a game changer for him. So I figure if it worked for me and I was at rock bottom, it worked for Robert Kiyosaki worth $80 million. If you're anywhere in between rock bottom and 80 million, (laughs) it could work for you. Oh, that's that's an incredible endorsement. Holy cow. You know, obviously, you guys all know Robert Kiyosaki, author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, I just have to enhance some of some of what you said, because, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I talk about meditation. You know, I listen to to two podcasts, Joe Rogan and Tim Ferriss, and nice. to try to get both sides of the aisle. Okay, mm, and mm. On, on Tim on Tim Ferriss's show, he interviews the best of the best in the world, including Ray Dalio, best athletes. You know, Michael Phelps and uh, best actors, uh, Ed Norton, Hugh Jackman, Arnold. Um, yeah. You know, billionaires like Zuckerberg. I mean, the best of the best in their walks of life, and he deconstructs their success. Mm. And um, and I started to hear a pattern. Many of them meditate, most of them. And, and I, I use this as an analogy to tell people about the importance of focus, how focus is power. So I use that as an example of focus. So that's number one. You know, the affirmations. I've got, I use I am statements, you know, because anything you put the words I am in front of is an identity statement. So, you know, mm-hmm. I am success. I'm the world's greatest husband. I am, you know, uh, cor- courage, whatever, whatever, every, whatever I'm trying to build in my life. I use affirmation and I have for years. In fact, I used to yell this shit running down the street. My nice. kids helped me at my, my kids helped me at my boot camps. Now I've got an exercise room, but my kids help me in my boot camps. And that's the question they get most often. Did he really do that shit when he's running down the street? Like, yeah, he did. We had to hear it. So, so <laughs> affirmations, visualization. I visualize my, 
you know, everything I, I, I use examples of cars that I've gotten in my life where I put pictures of the cars on the visor before I got them. You know, uh, uh, I, I show an example of my, my planner, which has, uh, the cars that I've had, the stupid shit that I thought was important, the Lambo and the Rolls and the Bentley, yeah. all the stuff that I got because I had pictures and I visualized them. Of course, the exercise, that's a no brainer. I've got a thousand books in my library downstairs. I never went to college. Reading is a no brainer. <clears throat> all of these things. And, journaling the fact that you journal ascribing you call it but the, the fact that you journal magic moments i've got some journals up there on the bookshelf and i tell people this as, as part of a planning process that i i walk them through which includes blocking time by the way uh yeah. and i tell them journal for five freaking minutes a week about anything amazing that happened that week and i I, I, I did it with my kids. I pull those journals down and, and we laugh. My daughter cries when we go through some of this stuff and it's such a gift. So, yeah. you know, you're right. When you can incorporate all of these incredible time-tested strategies, it's, it's, it's game over, man. And so, yeah. so why don't we talk about um, the enhancements you've made to the book, like your new yeah. book, basically. It's a new book now. So yeah. if, could yeah, you talk so, about that? And make sure you give me your address at the end. I don't know if I have that yet. I got to send right. you, I'll send you a signed copy. Uh, Thank you. Um, yeah, but uh, so so the original Miracle Morning book published on December 12th, 2012, 12, 12, 12. I thought it was a great date to uh, to, to, to put a book out. Um, it's been 11 years. And oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I almost died on 11, 11, 11. I swear to God. I was in a Lamborghini. I got in a car accident and, and I and I almost died. Had to have surgery anyway. I just, I couldn't let that go by so without that's a memorable date for you, I would right, imagine. Right, yeah, right, right. For, anyway, for sorry to interrupt. Reasons. Yeah. Right, right, um, right. So, uh, so the new edition, there's really two reasons that I wrote it. Um, well, I, there's three. Number one, if you go back and read your own work from 10 years ago, you're embarrassed by it, right? So even though the Miracle Morning sold millions of copies, I've always, whenever I go back, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I wrote that. I, uh, you know, I was such a kid. I was so immature. I, you know, I was so cheesy. So I always wanted to improve it just for my own, you know, selfishly. Like I wanted this to be a better representation of who I am as a person, right? The second thing is that the Miracle Morning, um, when I, when I started doing it, you know, I was brand new to these practices. And then I started writing the book probably six months later. So I was relatively new. I've been doing the Miracle Morning for 15 years now. I've done over 4,500 Miracle Mornings. So mm -hmm. I have created my own custom meditation practices. I've taken the best of the best of these various practices and enhanced them. So I always wanted to be like, hey, I want to write a book that everything from the original, it's still in there. I did rewrite it, make it better, but it's all in there. But then there's 70 new pages of content interwoven throughout the entire thing. So for example, the savers section alone has 25 new pages of advanced mm. techniques for silence, affirmations, visualization, all of that. And then nice. I added two new chapters to the end of the book, the miracle evening, which is your strategy for blissful bedtime and better sleep. Because when I speak at events, I always say, Hey, raise your hand. If you struggle either falling or staying asleep, I've been asking that a while. And it's like 50%, if not more of the room. And I went through a really difficult time in 2020 coming off chemo where I was sleeping two to four hours a night for six months. And it was the worst time in my life. Um, and, uh, and I figured it out. I went, I relentlessly figured out how to solve that chronic insomnia and that severe sleep deprivation. And now it's like, I wanted to help other people. So that's a 22 page chapter in the book. Uh, and then there's also the last chapter in the book is called The Miracle Life. It's your path to inner freedom. And it's basically teaching what I did during my car accident where I was so happy, genuinely happy, even though I was being told I would never walk again. And I told my doctors, they thought I was delusional because I was so happy. I said, no, yeah. you guys don't get it. I can't change that I was in a car accident. I can't change that I broke 11 bones. If I'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life, then I'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life. But I can choose to be the happiest, most grateful human being that you've ever met going through all of that. And so I'm going to teach you in the miracle life in that chapter, how do you optimize your mental and emotional well-being no matter what's going on outside of you? How can you be genuinely at peace in the face of the most difficult time in your life? And with so many people going through it right now, I feel like now is the, an important time to be able to understand how to take control of your inner world. No, that's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. I've got a question. Yeah. How did, what brought that energy to you when you're in the depths of that situation for you to approach things with that 
with that frame of mind. I mean, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a challenging. I mean, it was this, were you modeling someone you'd seen? Did you read something? Did you hear something? Where'd that come from? Yeah. No, it, it, 100%. So a year and a half before my car accident, I got hired to sell Cutco Cutlery and uh, okay. direct sales, right? Right. And on my second day of training, um, I learned something called the five minute rule. And my manager, my mentor, now one of my best friends, Jesse Levine, he basically said this. He said sales, and this would apply to real estate as well, but sure, he said sales is a microcosm for life in terms of adversity. He said, in other words, the average person faces rejection occasionally. The average person fails occasionally. He said, you're going to face rejection multiple times a day on the phone, in person, et cetera. You're going to fail at least a few times a month. You're going to fail to reach a goal. You're going to fail it, right? And he said, you need a strategy to quickly move through adversity so you can keep moving forward because most human beings, they can't succeed at sales or not that they can't, but they don't because they can't move through the adversity and they let it win. It's like, I tried, I can't do this. I suck at this, I failed, right? So he said, the five minute rule simply states that when something goes wrong, you set your timer on your phone for five minutes, literally, and you allow yourself five minutes to feel your emotions fully. Bitch, moan, complain, cry, vent, punch a wall, like whatever you gotta do. Don't suppress your emotions. Don't pretend like you're big and tough and it's okay. Feel your emotions fully. He said, when the timer goes off after five minutes, though, you say three life-changing words. Can't change it. Can't change it. You, it's an acknowledgement that, okay, I can't change what happened five minutes ago, so right now I have a choice. I can either continue to be upset over something that I can't change, which is futile. It doesn't change anything, and I'm self-creating emotional pain unnecessarily. So choice number one is you stay upset. Choice number two is you accept reality exactly as it is. And it doesn't mean you're happy that that thing happened, but it's far more powerful. You're at peace with it. And here's the thing. Happiness is an emotion and emotions are fleeting. You could be happy one minute and get a phone call. Bad news. Now you're not happy. Well, then you get another phone call. You won the lottery. Now you're happy, right? So emotions are fleeting and they're short lived. But when you accept your life as it is and you don't waste your energy wishing that things in the past or even things in this moment are different than, the, than reality is, you allow yourself to be at peace and that's a state of consciousness. It's, I am at peace with my life. You know, yeah, some of these things, they suck and I right. hate that they happen. But because I can't change them, I will not allow them to determine my mental and emotional well-being. I will choose to accept them exactly as they are and be at peace. And when I came out of the coma a week later and my dad came in and said, the doctors think you're in denial, Hal, because you're, you're just pretending like everything's okay. They think you're delusional. How, how are you really feeling when you're at night, you're by yourself, you're thinking of never walking again? I said, dad, I live my life by the five minute rule. It's been two weeks since the car accident. My five minutes are up. I can't change that I was in a car accident, broke 11 bones, and I might be in a wheelchair the rest of my life. But again, that's when I told my dad and he told the doctors, I've chosen to be the happiest and the most grateful I've ever been while I endure the most difficult time in my life. And then when I got cancer, I applied the exact same strategy. Hmm. Wow. So, I, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> how did you have the discipline to stick with that? Okay. Cause you're human. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you fought it on occasion, but, but I don't know. I, maybe, maybe yeah. I'm digging too deep with you well, here. No, but, but, I'll give you an, I'll, I'll, that's a great segue into affirmations. If that works for you, okay. it's actually an interesting Oh yeah. Feature. Hell yes. Yeah. Now, now I didn't know affirmations uh, when I had my car accident, I didn't know right. anything about him. Right. Um, right. However, uh, I had practiced that five minute rule for a year and a half consistently. And, mm -hmm. and I want to, I want to say this before we get into the affirmations. If you're listening to this right now, or you're watching this and you're thinking, how five minutes, dude, like I'm not going to get over. Cause that was my first thought when I learned this, I'm like, I'm not going to get over it in five minutes just because my timer went off. And the only reason that we say that is because that's how we've lived our lives. And everyone we know, that's how they've lived their lives. We've been conditioned to think when bad things happen, I feel bad. And I have no control over that. It's the bad. It's, and it's not my fault. It's the thing. It's what she said. It's what he did. Right. Not my fault. Right. I feel the way I feel because of what happened outside of me. Right. And 
I practice the five minute rule in little stuff like traffic, right? Most people get frustrated in traffic, you know, and I, and I used to, and then I would go, wait a minute, I can't change that I'm in traffic. I can either enjoy the next 30 minutes in this traffic or I can be miserable. That's my choice. I can't change it. What am I going to do? And so the first time I had to do the five minute rule, I remember I, I drove out to this woman's house. She was 45 minutes out in the boonies. Um, but her, her friend that referred her said, oh, she's a great customer, you know, good, good, good lead for you. I'm like, all right. So I made the drive out. When I got there, there was a note on her door. It said, I don't want any knives exclamation point. And I knock on wow. the door and she's not there. And I was so mad. I thought, what? that's what, how rude. Like, first of all, she had right. my phone number. She could have called me back, you know, oh man. Right. So I get in the car. I set my timer for five minutes. I start driving away and I'm just stewing. I'm just like, what a, ah, you know, I won't say what I'm saying, thinking, right. you know, but right. like, I can't believe she did that. You know, and so now, now I, now I wasted an hour and a half of my day. I could have had another appointment. Now I missed the sale. You know, so I'm just going on and on and the timer goes off, right? Time flies five minutes later, timer goes off and I hit the snooze button. I'm like, I'm still pissed. <laughs> See, I, I was right. Five minutes isn't enough. But Rod, something magical happened within about a week or two of doing this. I think it was on week two. It was a Sunday. I scheduled two appointments for that day because I was $2,000 away from my goal for the week. Now, selling $2,000 in a day with Cutco, I mean, the biggest set we had was 750 bucks. So you'd have to sell two and a half of them, right? Um, so the odds aren't very good, but I'm going for it. Go to the first appointment. She buys nothing. I'm like, ha, ah, crap. I'm going to my last appointment of the day. I got, I got to sell $2,000. She ends up buying $2,300. I am on cloud nine. She bought three sets, one for her house, one for their vacation home, and one for her mom. And wow. I'm just, I'm stoked. And um, so I, I, I celebrate. I call my manager. I said, Jesse, I just sold $2,300. I said, I hit my goal for the week. He said, not only did you hit your goal for the week, Hal, that makes you the number one rep in the office for the week. We're going to recognize you this week at the weekly team meeting. Now I'm 19 years old at the time. I've never done anything in my life that I've been recognized for, right? So I'm on cloud nine. I call my mom and dad. I'm like, you guys should drive down for this. Come to the meeting. It's a big deal. 9.03 PM that night, I get a phone call and it's the woman. And she says, my husband came home. He got so mad that I spent that much money on knives. I got to cancel the order. And I go, Oh no, no. You know, I try to talk her into it. The, the there's a money back guarantee. Give it a shot. Right? No, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm devastated. And I pick up my phone out of habit. Cause I've been doing that every time I feel upset. I just automatically hit the timer for five minutes. I hit the timer and I go, son of a, I can't believe she did that. God, she would have, she loved those knives. Her husband would have loved those knives, man. Now I didn't hit my goal for the week. I'm not going to get recognized at the team meeting. What can I even do? I mean, all I can do is wake up tomorrow morning and I guess make more calls and try again next week. And I picked up my phone and there was four minutes and 32 seconds left. And I went, wait a minute, what's the point in dwelling on something I can't change for four and a half more minutes? Why don't I just say, can't change it now, accept it, be at peace with it and go enjoy the rest of my night. And I immediately went, you know what? Not only is five minutes long enough, it's a waste of time to be upset. I'm going to make it the five second rule. Like, like, <laughs> let, get, let me feel the emotion. Maybe it takes 30 seconds, whatever it takes. The number's arbitrary. But I right. realized I have control over my mental and emotional state. And the way, <laughs> the, the key that unlocks the door to that freedom, if you will, is acceptance. It's accepting the things I can't change, not wishing they were different, but being yeah. at peace with them. And yeah, so so if you're listening and five minutes sounds like not enough, it probably won't be at the beginning. But after a week or two of doing this, you're going to realize, I don't even know if I need five minutes, man. I can just move through things quickly now. Yeah, that's awesome, buddy. I, the incredible value in, in sharing that five second rule. I'm really glad I asked the question that, that prompted that. Um, so let me ask you this. Obviously, that was some incredible advice. One of the questions I wanted to ask you is what's some of the best advice you've ever received? Can you, can you, can you maybe give me number two? Okay. Because I, I, you've got such great insights. I'm sure something else uh, incredibly valuable will come out of that question. So what's some of the best advice you've ever received besides the one you just shared? Yeah, I'd say some of the best advice I've received comes from Michael Singer's book um, okay. or any of Michael Singer's books. The Untethered Soul was the first one I read, mm -hmm. and then I read The Surrender Experiment. Um, but basically, Michael Singer talks about, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here, but it, it goes along the lines with optimizing your mental and emotional state. He says, all we want is to feel good. 
right? Like every choice that we make is because of how we believe the choice or the outcome of that choice will make us feel, right? I'm going to, I'm going to buy that Lamborghini because it's going to feel good to buy it. It's going to feel good to drive it. It's going to feel good to show my friends, right? Um, you know, I'm bored. I'm going to turn on the TV to change the way that I feel to change my inner state. Right. Um, and so, and this really goes hand in hand with this. It's really the follow-up lesson to this acceptance lesson. Cause when you accept life as it is now you find a place of peace, you're emotionally neutral, but then it's about choosing your optimal state. How do you want to feel? And so I use my miracle morning to condition my optimal states of consciousness, or in, in in simpler terms, my optimal mental and emotional states. So it's about choosing to be at peace, choosing to be grateful, choosing to be happy, choosing to be confident. And then I use my, in the new book, I teach a new technique that I have developed over the years called emotional optimization meditation. And it's essentially where you ask, when you wake up, you go, okay, how am I feeling right now? Not how do I want to feel, how, how am I feeling? And really be quiet and really get, you go, yeah, you know what? I got some stress. I, I, I'm, I'm a little stressed. You know what? There's some fear over the economy. There's some fear over this. You know, I'm a little angry over yesterday. Right? So you got to get those emotions and bring them to the surface. And then I'll actually, I'll use my scribing and I'll write them down, right? Hmm. Okay, now they're out of my head. Now they're on paper. I don't, I don't, they're not inside me anymore, Right. I, I, I can see them. They're separate from me. And then I ask myself, what is the optimal mental and emotional state for me to be in today? And that might vary day to day. The, the default is bliss for me. I want to feel mm. blissful. I want to feel happy. I want to enjoy every moment of this one life that I've been blessed to live. So that's the mm. default state that I'll get into just bliss, gratitude, happiness. And I'll set my timer for five minutes or 10 minutes, and I'll meditate in that state. And what you're, when you do that, you are rewiring, you're reprogramming your subconscious mind, rewiring your nervous system. You are making that more of a default state, a default way that you feel. It's how you generate happiness instead of allowing happiness to be dependent on external conditions. Now, if I have a presentation to give, I got to give a speech, confidence might be the state that I choose. If I got in a fight with my spouse the night before, I might choose that I need to be in a state of love and empathy and forgiveness. And I might ask myself, when was the last time I felt deeply in love with my spouse? Or what's great about her? What, what could I appreciate, right? And then I'll set my timer and I'll get into that state. Now, when she walks out of the bedroom in the morning, instead of being triggered over the fight we had last night, I feel that love toward her because I generated it. It wasn't dependent on an apology from her. It wasn't dependent on whether or not she smiled at me or, or glared at me when she walked out. I choose how I feel in every moment of my life. Yeah. So that's the greatest lesson I've learned is that you can choose your mental and emotional state. But if you don't get the first part right, if you don't learn how to accept the things that are causing you inner turmoil, there's no space to choose. So those are sequential lessons. Accept life exactly as it is. Set that five minute timer, get to the place of, I can't change it. So the only intelligent choice I have is to accept it. And now what state do I want to be in? And I will now condition that state. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. You know, I spent 20 years following Tony Robbins around the planet, and, you know, a lot of this stuff was resonating with totally. a lot that he he talks about as well. Um, well, listen, brother, I really appreciate you coming on, and and uh, I can't wait to read the new book and uh, start gifting that instead of the old one. And, uh, you know, it's great to see you again. And I know we just crossed paths. We we talked about this before we started recording. Right. We both uh, were keynoters at uh, at a military investor conference from one of my, one of my students is involved in called ADPI, which is just a great organization. And we missed each other, but uh, that was just last week, even. So That's right. anyway, but it's great to see you, brother. And uh, and you, I look forward to hopefully shaking your hand in person one of these days. You know? Heck yeah, Raw. Thank you, brother. Uh, I appreciate you right. more than you know, man. Thank you for this. Uh, and thank, uh, uh, thank until you. Until next time. All right, bud. So one other quick thing. We encounter so many people that are frankly frustrated. You know, they're looking in the mirror and they're frustrated that they haven't been able to escape the rat race. They haven't been able to build cash flow to the point where they're able to have financial and time freedom with their families. You know, and maybe they see other people buying real estate and creating, you know, incredible cash flow. And they think, well, it's just scary. You know, buying apartments is intimidating. And I get it. 
See, that's why we created our Warrior Mentorship Program. They're our coaching students, and they've had extraordinary results. My students, I've been teaching about five years, and they own upwards of 140,000 units now that we know of, right? And we feel like it's just getting going. Now, we're looking to grow this group and really take it to the next level and honestly believe that the greatest transfer of wealth could be upon us right now with this current economic environment. Everything's going on sale. So we're looking for people who want to follow a proven framework, really like a blueprint or a map, literally step by step. And then they're able to leverage our systems and our incredible network to raise money and equity, to find deals and close those deals and build partnerships really nationwide. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more in our incredible network and take advantage of the unbelievable opportunities that are upon us, you can apply to my Warrior Mentorship Program by texting the word CRUSH to 72345, or you can go to mentorwithrod.com. And what we'll do is we'll set up a call so you can check us out and we can check you out and see if it's a fit. Now, again, you can go to mentorwithrod.com or text the word CRUSH to 72345 to apply, and we will speak soon.